family out of darkness. Doesn't everybody deserve that opportunity? And if you're around me very long, you'll know that I have a, I'm a dreamer. I'm a dreamer. A few years ago, this shopping center was a dream. In a few months, we'll, Lord willing, start a daycare. Because we want to be the best church in this town, and the best church in this town is the church doing the most for this town to hear about Jesus. And I haven't backed down on my commitment to see us uh, launch churches in uh, Walter Hill or Gladeville or Blackman or the Laverne side of Antioch. You're saying, are you reading all this? No, it's just from the heart today. God has given us an effectual door that is open for souls. He is just looking for people who are willing to dream. What God can do is directly proportional to what you believe he is able to do. If, if you don't think he can do it, he can't do it. But if you think he can do it, guess what? He can do it. We should not limit God today. And so I know I've talked about a lot of things. I just want to let you know that God is still working. Thank you, Sister Elizabeth. Let me say it again. Maybe you'll catch up. God is still working. God is still working, and I apologize to our ladies' department. It got past me. Uh, I'm doing temporary youth pastor work. You pray for me about that. I told my Sunday school class that I could either play competitive volleyball with the kids Friday night, or I could walk on Saturday. I couldn't do both. <laughs> Can I tell you, you've got wonderful kids. You, you have wonderful kids. You, and I, if I've heard it once, I hear, Pastor, I know you're busy. I am busy, but what is important is still important. Your children are important. And I will clear my calendar. I will cut out wasted things that I can invest in them. Thank you, Julie, for helping me. Thank you, Doug and Ashley, for helping me. Thank you, Brooklyn and Joey, for helping me. And we've got some, here's a new word for you, some tweeners, teen, twenties. Adolescence is becoming longer and longer. When it was my age, by 18, you was out of the house. By, by 20, you was married. I said it's different. I said it's different. I wasn't even looking your direction. But there is no basement in my house for anybody to move into. Right? It is, it is a new day, and I respect that. And so I'm, I'm, I want to use some of these tweeners, late teens, 20s. They have a role in this too. And I know this seems a little radical, but pastor has a desire to equip, invest in them to help work with younger adults, if that's okay. I admit I don't know what is popular. It did make me feel good when somebody said, man, Pastor, you're the coolest. Well, I don't know if that's true or not. It's amazing what you can get kids to say about you when you take them to get ice cream. Brother Charles, thank you for investing. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. If you have your Bibles today, we are starting our next ship of the five ships of the faith. The first one was relationships. Anybody here? benefit from our series on relationships. Anybody benefit? Okay. God uses relationships. Why don't you stand? God uses relationships to help us get to where we're going. He gives moms and dads. He gives spouses. Amen. He, he gives us friends and family that exhort in us righteousness and call us to be better, mentor and train us. And relationships done bad can destroy us. Relationships done right can save us. God gives us another ship. It's called discipleship. Don't be discouraged if a few people are out today. There is a, a bug or a virus that's attacking about a third of the church. You pray for them that are not here. Many of them said they're going to be watching via Facebook live stream. So thank you, Brother Robert and others who help us in that ministry. I told him I'm going to discipline myself to stand right here. And so that being said, look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, look at verse 1 today. The very painful discussion about discipleship is what we're going to start with. The Bible says in verse 1 of chapter 12, 
I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your, everybody say reasonable. When counseling or talking or even correcting people, my new phrase is, is that reasonable? Am I being reasonable? It is reasonable that we would serve our creator. Look at verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Today I want to preach a very simple thought about the things I am afraid of, what I am afraid of. Lay your Bibles down in your seat. Lift your hands and hearts towards heaven and say, Jesus, today. Everything that I am and everything that I'm not today, I lay open before you, God, that your word would help me examine myself. And God, I can evaluate my attitudes and actions and thoughts and desires. And I can see them transformed into what you desire for my life, that real change real identity with you, God, that I would be a real disciple. We pray this in the name of Jesus, and let everybody say amen. Now, since you're already standing up and you've put your Bibles, see, why don't you shake hands and be friendly today and say, I'm glad to see you in the house of the Lord. Amen. I got sidetracked today. Forgive me. I meant to say I apologize to our ladies that I scheduled a youth outing on top of ladies' Mother's Day banquet. Youth, hear me. Instead of the Friday night, we're going we're gonna to do a scavenger hunt and pizza. We'll do it on Saturday, the very next day. So just go ahead and mark that down. I don't want you to miss an opportunity to be with your mother on that Friday night, so forgive me for neglecting that on the schedule. Today, I'm, I'm very excited to stand before you. If you know anything, I, I like to know what things mean. We understand from the online dictionary, Merriam-Webster's version, that a disciple is a student or follower of a teacher or a leader or philosopher. From the Latin, it means to be a learner. It's really more than following. It is an implication of application of new gained knowledge. Can I say it this way? There were many followers of Jesus. Many followed him for the fishes, to witness a miracle. The Bible says even some followed him for the artman that they may take reason to accuse him, find fault with him. See, a lot of people follow things today. They follow you on Facebook and Twitter, or they follow you in trending news stories. And it's pretty easy to follow somebody. A friend of mine recently sent me a a link, and it was a link of the top ten, from his perspective, sermons that 
had been written and preached in the last 150 or so years. And many of us have heard classic sermons like Sinner in the Hands of an Angry God that just riveted people. And I, I remember as a young man hearing Brother T.F. Tenney via Memorex cassette tape. I got a generation where was like, do what? Do what? Is it live or is it Memorex? I can still hear T.F. Tenney preaching one more night with the frog. That there's a generation that wants to get what they want more than they want to do what God is calling them to do. Still rings in my ear. And one that I was not really expecting was a sermon written in 1956 by Martin Luther King Jr. Preached in the Baptist Church, Central Alabama. Many people today don't realize that Dr. King was a preacher pastor. We think of him only as a civil rights leader. All of us can hear that one phrase, I have a dream. And that speech catapulted a movement to the finish line where real change happened. But when he was asked, he said, my calling is to be a preacher. I have no desire to run for office or lead an organization except the local church. Now, civil rights is a popular thing to talk about. Politicians run to the microphone as fast as they can to declare they are the biggest advocate for civil rights. But it wasn't popular in Dr. King's day. It was very unpopular. Do you realize that he even knew that what he said could get him killed? But his desire, even though it was unpopular, to see lives line up with Scripture, that every man is equal in the sight of God. I hope I'm not getting resistance on this sermon. Can I say today, the preaching of the gospel is unpopular. It's popular to preach or talk about civil rights now, but it's unpopular to talk about Scripture or the things of God. In many places on the face of our earth today, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ can get you killed. It's coming to a church near you here. To call sin, sin. To go against what the popular culture says is okay today has serious consequences. There was a lady in the great state of Kentucky named Kim Davis that said, I am an official elected by this county, but I will not sign a marriage certificate saying that one man can marry another man or a woman can marry a woman. And she was put in jail. And that is in the South where we're considered to be in the Bible Belt. I am telling you the Bible says there's coming a day. They will not endure legitimate teaching or sound doctrine or things that are just obvious if you're looking. Today many Christians decide what's right and wrong by taking some sort of poll or survey of their friends or those they run with or their associates to decide what's okay or not. Can I stop and talk about that a second? Just because all your friends smoke pot don't make smoking pot okay with the master. Just because all your friends are hooking up or sleeping with people and they're not married. Just because they're doing it don't make it right. Just because everybody's doing it. You know what? My Bible says the majority is usually wrong. He is coming back for a remnant. That's those who have chosen not to get caught up in the fray and separate themselves from what everybody else is doing. Many of us today have too great of a desire to be accepted into whatever different group we think is important. No one wants to be considered different. Actually, many of us are afraid of being labeled as different. You know what? You could be in a vast minority today just by declaring that God is good. Do you realize that Nashville 
has very few evangelistic pursuits because from the whole country's perspective, Nashville, everybody's saved. It's down-home America. It's the buckle of the Bible Belt. Do you realize that over 40% of the people who live in Nashville do not consider themselves religious nor are interested? The day that you keep telling yourself everybody's basically good people, that is not necessarily true. And people are afraid of being different. How many parents have bought kids tennis shoes they couldn't afford because their kid didn't want to be the only one? You allowed your child to participate in something because they were fearful if they didn't participate, they'd be labeled as weird or different. That's what Paul was telling the people of Rome. Do not be conformed. Do not let the world mold your perspective of the way things should be. Can I say it this way? If you are born again, you have dual citizenship. Yes, you are born in this world. And in this country, you're given a birth certificate. It's a legal document that declares your existence. But can I also say, when you're born again, your name is written in a heavenly place. In biblical times, the gatekeeper had a book and the name of every citizen that had right to enter that city, his name was kept in the book. Jesus says, I have written your name in the Lamb's book of life. You have citizenship in heavenly places. I have died to create a door that you can be saved. I know you got to work. I know you got to pay bills. I know you got to get along with your neighbor. But there's a king of a heavenly city. His name is Jesus. And he has called you to obey the voice of the king. I'm born in this world, but I bear record in heaven. I need to understand i got to live peaceably if possible with my neighbor. i got to contend with people that have differing opinions. But you got to, at the end of the day, align yourself with heavenly things. Because this life is but a vapor. You're here one second, and then you're not. But heaven is eternal. It is without end. Matthew 10 and 28 says, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him. Notice, those who can kill the body are them, but there's only one that can do both. Which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Can I stop and say that just a second? When was the last time you heard hell preached in church? Too many today are not comfortable. They put their finger in the air and ask their friends, do you think there's a hell? And because those around them say, well, I don't think God would do that, then there must not be a hell and you don't hear it preached about. We cannot be worried about what people say. We cannot be worried about how many likes and how many shares nor how many followers. We got to be concerned about what he who sat on the throne is saying. If I'm a citizen of that city that's eternal, I got to be interested in what the king is speaking to my heart. Y'all know that I've got some very basic principles that I live by. Is it illegal? Is it immoral? Is it unethical? And what's my fourth one? I added one a few years ago called Is It Offensive? Because we do have to be careful not to offend. And if you were in my Sunday school class this morning, we talked about it briefly. Can't just can't be offensive. I will tell you that I made Julie cringe several times while we were in school. We weren't married yet. I was just a boy of interest to her, or was that, I, she was a girl of interest to me, I, I, think it, I think it went back and forth. 
she shared with me several times, ooh, I can't believe you said that. She will tell you she's not one who desires conflict. I don't like conflict either, but I do like being right and doing right. Does that make sense? In the Christian school we went to, I took a, I took an, a verbal beating from the teacher. It was a Presbyterian junior high and high school, and, and I learned so many great things and concepts and biblical knowledge that I credit those key leaders to. They were good to me. But we were in a class, and they started quoting Martin Luther's writings like they were Scripture. And one such thing they began to quote in Bible class, and I sat there. You ever just feel your blood pressure going up, and the redness starts in your neck, and it starts... And they got to the point, they were quoting Martin Luther, the Reformation, Reformationist, to such a degree that they were making canonized scripture secondary to what he, as a man, said. And they finally pushed it just a little too far. Did I mention I was the only Pentecostal in that group of about 26? It welled up in me. And I just had to tell them straight, Parables and fables of men will not suffice with the truth that brings liberty from the Word of God. They, they started telling me that you're predestined. You, you're either de destined to be lost or destined to be saved. My Bible says, whosoever will. If you wake up in the morning and you realize you're far from, you don't tell me I'm just born to be lost. God didn't born you to lose you. God birthed you. And gave you free will. And he gave his life as a ransom. That if you wake up and realize you need him, he will run to you. Don't tell me it has to be this way. My dad gave me great advice. He said, son, you know the truth. I said, yes, sir. He said, but you know what that teacher wants on the answer in that Bible class too, don't you? I said, yes, sir. So what does that mean? He said, I said, write what he wants, but know what's right. Can I go on to say this? I'm tired of losing our kids to secular colleges to where professors distort and warp their minds and they never find their way back to the cross. It doesn't have to be that way. I'm, I'm we need to establish in their hearts and their minds that thus saith the Lord and it's not to be messed with. Here's where I'm going. We must speak the truth in love. My greatest desire is to know truth and do right. My delivery matters. I don't want to be offensive. I don't want to say you're stupid or you're low down and high smelling. i got to speak it in love out of, a, out of a heart's desire to help you see and accept and embrace truth. But at the end of the day, I've got to preach the gospel and let the chips fall where they may. I'll go ahead and tell you next week if the Lord allows me, I'm going to teach us about what the cost of being his disciple is not everybody wants it but my biggest fear today my sermon title is based on this one simple thing my biggest fear that there are some here today that think you're okay and one day you're going to wake up in the devil's hell and torment forever and when you realize it it's going to be too late You don't think I want to come in here and preach some happy sermon? Is life hard? Absolutely. I'd love to come in here and give you poetry and toilet water and chocolate candy and tell you. But what parent feels right giving their child candy for breakfast, lunch, and supper? What's going to happen? It's going to rot their teeth. And some of you won't ever be able to devour the meat of God's word because your teeth have been rotted out from too much prosperity doctrine. Come as you are, stay as you are. We've got to be able to handle the truth. Firstly, I'm fearful that some think they're okay when they're not. And secondly, I'm concerned for those who never feel like they are secure when they really are. Both of these are cruel. I'm not complaining. 
but some days I'm walking a very tight rope, a very narrow line. I am fearful of either making you feel secure when you're not or insecure when you are. Matthew 7 and 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall not enter in the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Do you understand from this passage, it is obvious that the people here he is talking to, they are deceived. They believe themselves to be saved when the master says, I don't know you, depart from me. And some of you are already tensing up in your seat. But I taught Sunday school. I came to the front. I shook the preacher's hand. I gave. I went. I did. But at the end of the day, not everybody who followed him will hear him say, well done. There are things that we must do, and Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7 here, it's those who do the will. Obey. There's got to be some action involved. To come as you are and stay as you are and think your destination is different, you're deceiving yourself. Many have made hell unpopular, but just because it's not popular doesn't mean it's not true. Many have just refused to accept what is real. Can I tell you this today? Denial is not a solution. Ignore it, it goes away, right? Deny it, it doesn't happen, right? I won't accept that. Well, bully for you. I think I can fly. I jump off the Empire State Building and the whole way to the ground, I think I can fly. But when I go splat, no matter how I feel, no matter how I try to deny gravity, I'm still subject to the law of God, and so are you. Chase a rabbit. It's a small rabbit. It won't take me long. I had a friend of this church try to tell me that his Disobedience to scripture was no big deal. He did not understand how a Bible written 2,000 years ago has any impact on him. Yet he spent vast amounts of time explaining to me about life on other planets. He's, he's looking for that loophole, somebody. You ever met that person? But there's life on Mars, so what? Who's ever driven a car? On I-24, what's the speed limit? I wish I could do 70 sometimes on it. It's more like creep and roll, creep and roll. But if traffic was open, you could do 70 legally. Who's ever been to Germany? They have the Autobahn. What's the speed limit on it? Fast as you can go. Can I give you a word today? I don't care how many times you've been to Germany. If there's people in Germany driving on the Autobahn with no speed limit, if you're in Tennessee and you're on I-24, it don't matter what's happening there. Can I tell you what? As long as you're in God's creation, you are subject to what God has said for his creation. I don't care what they're doing on Mars. But there may be life in other galaxies. So what? The God of this universe has called me out of darkness. I got to follow him. Amen. Thank you for that. Many have refused to accept. They're in denial mode. I'm hurrying. Well, we serve a God of love. And a God of love would not punish or be so vile and torturous to people. My Bible says you don't have to go very far. It's in the sixth chapter of the first book that God was sickened. His stomach was churning. He almost vomited out of what he saw from man. It made him so discomforted that he sent a flood and drowned almost everyone. Hmm. Who remembers Pharaoh, he 
wouldn't turn God's people loose. The God we serve says that if you don't let my people go, I'm going to kill every firstborn son. That's what he says. But that's the God of the Old Testament. He's much nicer now. Do I need to read for you the book of Revelation? I'm going to preach to somebody right here. Do you know that God has a plan for how this thing's going to end? And if you're not in the right camp, it ain't going to end well. See, God is not monochromatic. He's not just black and white. we got to view him through the prism of love. But within a prism, there's a full spectrum of color. Everything from infrared to ultraviolet and every color in between. And that's why the writer says that we might experience the manifold grace of God. That's the multicolored grace of God. He's not one dimension. He's many dimensions. Can I say it this way? God is righteous. He is holy. He is loving. He is faithful. He is jealous. And he's all those things simultaneously. He's not one dimensional. But that's Old Testament. Can I tell you, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he changes not. If he hated a certain behavior in the past, he hates it in the present. He's going to hate it in the future. Y'all give me five extra minutes. We all like to run. It's, it's, like, it's like our little comfort lollipop. Who's ever had a Tootsie Roll? We want to run to John 6, 3, for God so loved, for God is love. But if you keep reading in that same chapter, he says, but those who don't obey my commandments. But I love you. I'm glad you love me. But the word says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, come and shake the preacher's hand. Just believe. Just believe. James tells us demons believe and tremble, but are they saved? It's going to be deep, y'all. Get ready for this. The only thing consistently we hear through Scripture when we come before a holy God is that we must repent. That's not popular today either. Repenting, acknowledging wrong, being able to say, I'm sorry, accepting change. But over and over and over again, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Be ye transformed. That means it's easy to be conformed to the way the world thinks, but you've got to apply yourself. You've got to become a disciple, not just following, but applying what you're learning, that I would come out and be different. If you don't want to stand out, don't be a servant of Jesus Christ. But I tell you, broad is the way that leads to destruction. But there's also a straight and a narrow, and few be who find it. You know why it's few? Because few people are looking for it. Today, my biggest fear is that firstly, you don't know that God has a plan for your life. Before I could talk about discipleship, where we bring ourselves under subjection, I had to talk to you about a fear that many people won't accept it. Number two, you don't believe you can. I've gone too far. I've done too much. I'm just not able to feel saved all the time. Can I say something? Anybody here ever stubbed your toe in the middle of the night? Did you feel real spiritual when that happened? Remember, you still have dual citizenship. I, my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, but I'm still in flesh and blood. And if I stub my toe, it's going to hurt. I've got to bring myself under subjection that I not only can know he has a plan, but I also know that he can fulfill his desire. I can be saved. And thirdly, is you believe you're okay when you're not. Many will be deceived. 
It's not just doctrine that our enemy, the devil, seeks to deceive us by. There are things that even a wicked and perverse generation won't accept. Even a lukewarm church knows better to do certain things. The biggest deception of our enemy, the devil, is not what truth is, but that you've got plenty of time. It's an issue, but I don't have to deal with it today. It's something I need to work towards, but I've got plenty of time. I wish there were funerals that I had done where everybody had the long life that Sister Moore had. But I've preached way too many funerals of way too many people that thought they had a lot more time, and their time ran out before they came to the knowledge of the truth that Jesus has come to save them from themselves. Not only is God able to save you, He is able to keep you. As you stand to your feet, today if you think you may be in one of these categories, I want to become a disciple, one who learns the ways of the Lord and applies them to my life. The Bible says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. If you don't know where you're at, if you don't know if God is able, or you're unsure if you're okay, I know you've got places to go. I know you have nice clothes on. But today, not because of me, but for your own selves, too many people are deceived because they don't take time to read this book for themselves. If we armed ourselves with a complete knowledge of what the Word of God says, it'd be impossible. But the enemy wants to keep us tired and busy where we never have time to examine the Word and apply it to our lives. And Sister Best sings this chorus today. Would you come and find yourself a place to pray? I've been dreaming.